Well, welcome to the last brown bag research seminar for the 2021 spring semester, everyone. Uh, my name is Ron Franz. I'm with the OU Institute for Quality Communities. I have environmental design program in the Division of Architecture. So um, I would just like to welcome all of you. Thanks. I know everybody's crazy busy right now, but thank you very much for joining us. We have three great speakers. They spoke at the AIA conference, the national conference, I believe in 2019, and I wasn't able to see them there. However, last September, uh, we had them speak at the AIA Oklahoma statewide conference, and they were one of the last speakers. And I always like to hang in there to the very end because sometimes it's the best speakers right there at the end. And in this case, they were just great speakers. So my first thought was, I wrote a note and I said, we must have them speak at a brown bag uh, session. And so I would like to thank Dr. Uh, Angela Pearson and Dean Hans Bootser, who responded to my um, very strong suggestion. Can we have a brown bag with these people? And I said, oh yes. So anyway, so um, we're glad you're able to join us. So today I'll do a brief little intro and then I will turn it over to them. First of all, we have speakers are coming from a different state on a different coast. And I guess that's the beauty of Zoom. We miss the in-person, but man, we can bring people in like we can never do this. First, you know, Lowe is a fellow in the American Institute of Architects. He's from Macau. Uh, he is head of YNL Architects Incorporated. I think that aligns with his initials. So I'm thinking he's the founder of the, of the business. It's based in Culver City, California, in the Los Angeles area, as well as in Hong Kong. And um, he's a licensed architect in both California and Florida. He's National Council of Architectural Registration Board certified architect, that's NCARB. He's also uh, an accredited professional in the LEAD program. And uh, he's also a member of the Construction Specifications Institute and he's a certified construction document technologist. A very serious professional here. Uh, if you look at his website, uh, he has tons and tons of awards that his firm has received over the years. Okay, welcome, you know, next, our next speaker, or our next person to introduce is Graciela Carrillo. She's a member of the American Institute of Architects. She's LEED certified as well. Her title is Senior Manager Two at NASA BOCES. I looked that up, that stands for Board of Cooperative Educational Services. You may even have a longer term than a longer title than some of us in academia. Uh, she's at the facility services and she's in New York. She's originally from Colombia, as in South America. Uh, she immigrated to the United States in 2003. She worked as an architect for Cash and Architects PC, where she led all scales of urban design, planning, and architectural projects. And recently, she joined NASA BOCES uh, Facility Services as a senior manager. Uh, Graciela has committed almost a decade of volunteer leadership service to the American Institute of Architects. She's been involved with AI at the local, state, and national level, currently serving as the AIA Long Island president, as well as the chapter's women in architecture founder and co-chair. On the national and state level, Graciela was past president of the New York Regional Director for the Young Architects Forum. Uh, she was co-founder of the Immigrant Architects Coalition with our other two speakers. Uh, in 2019, Graciela was recipient of the AI New York State Young Architect Award. Uh, last year, she founded Powerful Speeches Platform in an effort to champion women architects. Um, so like all the other speakers, Graciela has incredible commitment to helping those of you who are immigrant architects adjusting to uh, the United States. And our final uh, person to introduce is Shahad Siddiqui. She's an associate AIA member. Her title is architectural designer. She's with Smith Group in Dallas, Texas. Shahad um, has been at uh, Smith Group. She's an active member of the AIA at the local level. She's passionate about everything diverse voices in the profession and developing sustainable workplace culture. 
She's currently is co-leading an immigrant architect coalition with this group and sits on the JEDI committee board at Smith Group. And for those of you in Oklahoma, that may be a sort of a new term, architectural designer. It may be an unfamiliar term. In Oklahoma, the way our licensing laws are written, we can be architect interns, intern architects, or licensed architects. We can't use the architectural designer. So I just want to make a, a, a clarification on, on that just on that uh, uh, on that difference of that. So with that, I would like to just turn it over. I believe Yunok has, will lead us through the presentation. So again, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Ron. Um, let me start my uh, PowerPoint. Um, just, sorry, um, try to, it's always technical stuff. <laughs> can you hey, can you see that's my what screen? the old guys that's what the old guys <laughs> always say you young guys are supposed to have all this down you know i'm getting up there so <laughs> oh, okay <laughs> um can you see my screen ron and everybody i can okay cool um hi everyone first of all thank you very much uh ron for the introduction and and thank you very much for the school of architecture to invite us for this wonderful opportunity um we are extremely excited um, to, to, to talk about our experience with, with all of you. I assume uh, most, most of you are international students. So um, our title is Making an Impact as an Ar Immigrant Architect. And of course, it's hard um, to be an architect and it's even harder to, to, to be an immigrant to, to, to be here. So I hope that our story inspire you to try because yes, you can, um, doesn't matter where you're from. And, and if you have the will and if you have the right tool and tips, perhaps then you, you could achieve a successful career in here, here in the state. So, um, and thank you for the introduction again, Ron. So I'm gonna skip this part. Um, and um, a little bit about ourselves. Um, I think Ron mentioned it. We we started um, a session back in 2019 at the conference on architecture. So our goal was just to help our fellow immigrants to get adapted to to the life in here here in the U.S. So we 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 our title was how can immigrant architects uh, prosper in the U.S. So after we presented that session at 819. Um, the Conference on Architecture, we received a lot of feedbacks and, and, and that inspired us to do a little bit more. And that's why after the session, um, me, myself, uh, Saha and Grace, we decided to form the um, Immigrant Architects Co Coalition. And our goal and mission is to help um, our fellow immigrants, architects, and also extend to international students like you guys and hopefully we can create a community who who can help each other and eventually um and we, we're going to talk about this a little bit later um towards the end but we would like to invite um, every one of you to share your own experience and 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 i believe the best way to learn to navigate the system is to learn from each other so um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over, I'm not going to read the learning objectives and all that. I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, um, Sahar. So let me stop on sharing. And I have to make, do I have to make someone the presenter or? Um, I'm going to try sharing. I think it should be active and ready to go. Yeah. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? Yep, cool. Awesome. Hi, everyone. I'm Shahad Sadek. I started my journey um, with the AIA KC Equity and Architecture Committee, and I'm currently supporting the Dallas AIA with their EDI task force that they're building, um, part of the Immigrant Coalition and part of the board. I'm, I'm a part of board member of the Smith Group National Jedi Committee. Um, I'm originally from Iraq. Uh, but I grew up in Abu Dhabi. So my portion of the discussion is gonna focus a little bit about background and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about school to a career and then we're gonna finally really focus on beginning your career. So there are, for an international student, the natural pathway is to go through OPT, OP, then have an OPT STEM extension. Now architecture should be part of that. Um, and then to go to H1B and from then on the process becomes 
green card and blah, blah, blah. Um, make sure you check with your school if your school supports you with OPT STEM extension. So that's another two years or 17 months, something like that. Um, my uh, path of working in the US is through my asylum application. So it's based on my status. Um, so I have a story to tell <laughs> as an Iraqi Im you know, immigrant. So that I'm going through asylum itself. Um, so to t I'm gonna talk a little bit about your internships, what to, how to benefit from that, how to um, understand, you know, how to navigate that part of the world there. And then talk a little bit about your portfolio, interviewing your firm, and then your personal development. So the most important um, lesson I learned when I was doing my internship and starting my career is understanding how my values align with the firm values. Um, the tools that you could use for that to help you understand how you fit cultural, how to, how to understand the culture of the firm and then see how you fit in as part of it is through these simple tools. Simple, but <laughs> effective. <laughs> Um, so, you know, how open is leadership? Do they talk about, can you have, do you have two-way communication with them? Um, what are the incentive programs? So do they offer ARE study materials? Do they provide professional grants? Do they provide um, research grants um, for your personal interest? Um, how do the team interact with one another? Um, are they, um, you know, how do they collaborate? That's really important. What are the response attitudes of the team members about each other, about leadership and about the projects? Because that can tell you a lot about how um, people, um, uh, how it's kind of like talk culture. Um, word of mouth, what is being said about the company outside of, like the company itself or the firm, um, what is being said on the AIA level, what is being said between peers, pay attention to that. And then the feedback loop. So the feedback loop is something where you put out some kind of interest, a conversation, and see how it comes back to you. So if you're saying, you know, I'm really interested in doing uh, more renderings or graphics, how does that come back to you? Are they um, willing to have a conversation with you? If you're interested in a type of project, you know, are they, um, is it coming, are you having a dialogue with somebody? Are you able to advocate for yourself or ask for what you want? So you have to kind of keep that in mind. Um, so we'll move on to the next thing. Um, how diverse is your experience? Now that's really important. Do they pigeonhole you? And by pigeonholing you, do they put you in like one part of a project because it's simple or easy or whatever? Um, are they making sure that you are drafting, designing? Um, are you able to um, watch the process in meetings? Now we're in Zoom, our Zoom world. So you can definitely be flies on the wall, which before was you know harder to do. So are you involved in that? Um, are you able to understand, are you able to be plugged in into different aspects of a project? Another really important factor is how are, how's leadership recognizing passion pursuits? And maybe not yours yet, but with others, how do they um, talk about passion pursuits? Are they involved in the community? Are they, do they have passions themselves? Um, are they willing to teach? Is there a teaching culture? So all these parts are really important when you're considering the diversity of experience you're getting in your internship or you're starting your job. Um, Self-advocacy. This is a really hard one, <laughs> especially for international students. Um, most of the time we think that once we get into a firm, everything is set up for us. Like they know that we are level zero, that we're trying to figure it out. No, most of the time they don't know your level. And so what would happen is they could be very disappointed, very happy or overburdened. <laughs> so you have to make sure that you're communicating, asking questions. Don't be afraid to ask stupid questions because that's how you learn. Um, and also that helps them to understand what you're capable of and then have a little bit of understanding when they give you tasks and clarity because it sucks to have no clarity on a task and you're drowning <laughs> and the time is running. So make sure you're um, making your goals known. What do you want to do? What you want to be involved in? What, uh, how much you want to invest? How much time you have? Because it's gonna be really easy to work late nights. 
especially when you're new and um, you're ambitious. Um, so this is an important one. Learn who to address and what to request. Because sure, there is a hierarchy system in a firm where there's like the vice president, principal, whatever, but there's also power dynamics. And those happen subtly. They're not apparent. Um, just because somebody has a title doesn't mean that they have the power to give you a project. So be aware of the culture, be aware of who is actually calling the shots. Um, that would mean being in tune with your environment. So pay attention, be a listener. Walk in quietly and listen, ask questions, ask a lot of questions. Um, make sure you're asking questions about culture. This is so important. We don't think about that in our dynamic in, in, in architecture because we're not taught really that. We're taught, you know, you're the star of your show when you're designing, that's not true. It's collaboration all the time. So if you had a community studio or any kind of group studio setting project, that's the reality. You're never your own designer. Now, self-advocacy part two. <laughs> this is in, uh, language challenges are going to be there. Whether you are actually an international or not, um, even Americans have communication issues. <laughs> so uh, that is something we're all going to face. Um, but make sure that you are both um, um, assertive in um, clarifying your ideas, your thoughts. Don't uh, worry about um, offending people because they understand that you are learning how to communicate because you're from another culture and from another background. So make sure that you're not, um, don't, don't worry so much about how you say something. And if you're saying storefront or glazing system, it doesn't matter. To be corrected is important because then you learn the correct terms. It doesn't mean you are not smart or whatever. People are more compassionate than that. Cultural differences. This happens if I'm from Dallas and I'm talking to someone in Oklahoma, like that's gonna be there. Um, so understand that you have a right to your um, story, to your culture, um, negotiate, like make sure you tell that story because I think there's so much value in being diverse and having a diverse perspective, especially in design because that is where the power of diversity makes the company better. Um, the perspectives, because nobody wants to be in an echo chamber. And so your cultural background is like valuable insight into doing design better and more holistically. Um, nobody wants to say, oh, hindsight 2020, um, especially if you're interested in working in an international firm, speak up for that. Um, it's gonna hurt sometimes. People are gonna say awkward things to you. I've been asked, uh, once, how do I know Taylor Swift? Um, even though I grew up in Abu Dhabi, I said we had radio. So <laughs> it's going to be awkward, but um, it's part of being from a different place. And I think sometimes the conversations make it funnier when you're, when you, when you make fun of them for it. So people love sassiness. So be sassy. Um, bias at work. Please, 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 please make sure that you speak up if you ever experience anything. Um, tell HR, or if you don't feel comfortable telling HR, talk to a mentor or somebody from a similar background in your, um, in your firm. Because if maybe what you would say, what you spoke up about would help somebody else that haven't spoken up about it and you protect each other that way, you are going to face biases. Sorry, <laughs> this, is, this is life. We're trying hard. I'm on the Jedi Committee. We're working on it. I hope by the time you graduate, you never have to face microaggressions, but they're there. So just understand it's not you. It's not personal. People are learning how to um, navigate this new paradigm of, of diversity. So. Um, so this is important. And I hope you were taught, you were, um, given that lecture in your school. I never got this opportunity. So I always make sure to tell young people, interview your firm because you are giving them value. It, they're not just hiring you and doing you a favor. You are also doing them a huge favor. 
um, you're expensive and your time is expensive to you. So you're expensive to hire, but you are expensive for yourself, for your own value. So make sure you pick a firm that is that will work for you too. So here's some questions, but if you Google some questions, um, maybe something that you're more interested in, please make sure you walk in with questions. So what are the opportunities for growth? Even if you're an intern, that's important. Understand the structure of, of, uh, of the letter. Um, describe what a typical day might look like. They're gonna say, oh, maybe it's in your job description. No, because it's, it's not going to be what you think it is. So when you ask that question and they give you the answer, you will understand if you are in a place that gives you diverse experience or not. Um, what, are, what is your retention rate? I don't know if you guys know what retention is, but it's how many people stay in a company for how long. COVID is a little bit unfortunate during that time. Like a lot of people were let go, um, but still understanding the retention rate long-term for the last 10 years, maybe ask about that and see what that means because there are firms that hire, ramp up hiring uh, for a project. And then as soon as that project is done, you're gone. And you need to understand that kind of culture. And it exists, unfortunately, with some of the best firms you probably love. You don't want to work for a place like that. You want to work for a place that's going to educate you, that's going to invest in you, and that's going to teach you long term. Especially as internationals, we have, you know, OPT, OPT, and, H, and H1B, and green card. That's a long process. That's an investment. Um, and then the last question, or more than one I'm interested in, is do you have a Jedi committee? So do you have a representative that is watching out for you? Um, Jedi committee is a new thing. Um, it used to be EDI director. So even some, some firms might not even have a Jedi or EDI component. Um, but by asking that question, they will tell you if they have some kind of consideration in the firm right now, if they're thinking about it, if they say, no, we don't have a Jedi committee, we don't have an EDI director, but we are working with our leaders to understand what we need to do for diverse, for our, you know, the diversification of our staff, blah, 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 blah. So it opens up the dialogue. You want someone watching out for you. It's really important. Um, so not harp on that because you probably are learning this in school, but one of the greatest advice I've gotten was actually after starting work, um, everyone's like, it takes us 60 seconds to look at a page. Um, nobody's dwelling on the, on the portfolio, honestly. Um, they said four to five projects, each one demonstrating a different skill, but mostly focused on design thinking skills. Um, but also you want to, you know, you want to show off how your graphic, how you communicate in graphic skills, because you've got 60 seconds to tell them everything. You want to really think about how it all ties together. And then always have a hard copy. This is something that is debatable. You're going to send your portfolio, it could be love issue and websites or whatever to help you. But always having a hard copy in the room when you're being interviewed or when you're showing somebody, um, it's kind of like tactile and they appreciate that kind of nature where you can point and kind of display and talk about your stuff. Now, I didn't have a hard copy when I applied to Smith Group, but I had, I had set up a presentation and like had a pen and just walked them through it. And we talked about it and like zoomed in and looked at things. So you can, you can get away with that, but I always appreciate it because in the end we pass around the portfolio um, and most people can get a chance to like advocate for you too. Um, and then lastly, personal development. Um, school is fun. You get to explore different avenues of yourself. Um, but once you get into the workplace, sometimes you can get stalled because you're trying to learn how to draft and how to do construction documents. And that might not always be, um, oh, did I lose the screen? That might not always be uh, the most beneficial for your growth because you've got to develop soft skills as an architect and you don't always get that opportunity when you are working and drafting toilet details. Um, so get involved in the community somehow, some passion you like, be part of it and um, talk about it. Um, licensure, that's important. Uh, I am being a hypocrite because I haven't done my exams yet, but um, do it. <laughs> uh, do it as fast as you can um, because then you're just going to get overwhelmed with work and more responsibilities and then it'll get harder. Um, conference and continuing education. You will never stop learning. 
and uh, conferences are the best way to accelerate your knowledge. Um, now conferences are free, uh, which is awesome. Many of them are free and many of them are recorded. So you can like watch it whenever you want to. Um, there are so many things I learned by just seeing a video too. I don't have to like go to the whole conference and commit to everything, but I can like take videos that I'm interested in. I mean, Autodesk University has like, uh, it's free, it was free and, and um, they have so many amazing recordings about generative design, sustainability, blah, blah, blah. So get, it, get on board. Um, and hybridization, don't just be an architect, be an architect and something. This is the future, um, software is the future, computers is the future, coding, whatever, it's the future, whatever you want to do, hybridize yourself because you wanna be at the forefront, especially for immigrant architects. Um, we have to keep building our value over and over again. So anyway, that's my spiel. Thanks everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Shaha. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. So thank you, everyone. Again, uh, my name is Graciela Carrillo. Uh, I come from Bogota, Colombia. Uh, my story is a little bit different uh, from Jungblog and uh, Shahad in that the way that I came here, I, I went for architectural school in Bogota, Colombia and worked there for a while. And then I moved to New York with a work visa. Uh, right now, um, like Ron uh, introduced us before, I'm the president of the AIA Long Island chapter, which is a 75 year old chapter I am the third woman president and the first Latina president. So I'm very proud of saying, of saying this and communicating that to inspire others to, to follow leadership positions within AIA. So I'm gonna share with you a little bit about my experience as an immigrant architect. Um, so that way you can understand a little bit uh, the path and also um, I'm going to share a lot of resources that I wish I had when I was starting my process here in the US. So I came here uh, with a, like I said, with that H1B visa in 2003. And you'll see three different uh, levels, uh, the red one, blue one, and green, which is education at the top, middle was the immigration path, and the bottom is the volunteering. So uh, basically my education was all the way from the beginning. I went to school, I did my master's uh, here in New York at Pratt Institute. Uh, and then I became lead accredited professional. Then I finished all my licensing exams, which took me five years to the clock. It was a, a very, very long experience, but that's another whole session that we could talk about. Uh, I finally became licensed in 2013. And at the same time, I'm going through all my immigration, uh, you know, uh, process. So I, I want to highlight that, yes, it's very stressful. I, I had to renew my H-1B visa uh, one time, and then I was able to apply for a green card. And then finally, I became a citizen in 2015. So all of that stress of like talking to lawyers, being on top of legislation all the time, making sure you can get that green card and that citizenship, I was going through all of that through schooling and architectural licensing. So yes, it is difficult, but we can do it. We definitely can achieve that. Then uh, also at the same time, I joined AIA just because um, I was working for an engineering firm uh, all that time. And I felt like I needed that networking with architects. Like I needed to learn more from how architectural, um, the architectural pr profession worked here. So that was a good way of just starting to, to getting connected to more architects, learning how the ARE processes um, so in 2011, after me, like just attending to meetings and just going to the ARE classes, uh, I was invited to join the chapter, the Long Island chapter uh, board of directors uh, as an associate director because I didn't have a license. Uh, so I joined that. And then once I got my license, I was moved into the board of directors. Then I was the secretary, treasurer, 
vice president. And last year I was elected the president. This is my last year as uh, president. And then in the future, who knows what's gonna come. So why are we here? And Shahab mentioned a lot of, of this uh, diversity topic before. It's because definitely diversity in the workplace is a benefit for the firm because we're bringing all our cultural backgrounds. We're bringing all these different ideas and it's good for the firm in a healthy way, not only for uh, from a design standpoint, but also from a firm culture standpoint. Uh, so that's basically why we are here. On this slide, uh, you will see that uh, the representation of, uh, of diversity, racial and ethnic in the profession is very small. Um, I highlighted, of course, the Latino representation because I'm a Latina woman. We are uh, from, from all the licensed architects in the States, 1% are Latino or Hispanic uh, and women are 0.3%. So basically I represent 0.3% of the licensed population. And that's a really, really small uh, percentage. Uh, same with Asian, same with uh, black people. It's, it's, it's very, very small, but we are working together in uh, making these numbers much better and, and raising the bar. So on this slide, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the path to licensure. Uh, so the first thing really that you have to do is check with uh, your state what the requirements are. So whenever you're ready to start, some of you may be ready already, some of you may or not, uh, but uh, definitely check with uh, uh, your state. Uh, the link that you see here on the screen is the link on NCARB that is gonna tell you what the requirements are by Oklahoma, or you can go directly to your office of professions in Oklahoma and check with them what the requirements are. So from here, I found out that uh, an EESA evaluation of foreign education is accepted. I'm gonna talk about that later, um, but that's the first step that you have to do when you want to start your licensing process. So on this slide, uh, slide I'm basically uh, going to talk about the NCARB requirement. Um, so when you are going to start your licensing process, you have to open your NCARB record, okay? After you check with your state and see what are the requirements, uh, you, and you open your NCARB record, and then what I'm supposed to do with my foreign degree, if you're bringing a foreign degree uh, from your own country or from another country, um, because you may be doing a master's here, which was my case. So if, if, if you have that option, um, there are two ways of validating your degree. One is called the foreign educated applicant. And that one uh, is basically the EESA application that Oklahoma accepts. So basically what it is, is you get your um, degree from your country, um, all the classes, like the description of the, of the classes, all your transcripts, you have to uh, translate all of that. And then you have to apply for the EESA evaluation, which is a separate entity. Uh, different companies do that type of work. Uh, you can always contact me. I, I can refer you to a few of them. I, I went through that process, so I know what it takes. And then they are going to tell NAAB and ERCARP, yes, this degree from this country is acceptable as an accredited degree in the States. So that's one way of doing it. The other way is going through the foreign license applicant. And in that case, if, if you're coming from your country, and you have a license there. So if you have a license as an architect in your own country, you can go through this path and it will allow you to validate your degree through your licensing board in your own country. So those are the two, it's very important. This is a new system that started about two years ago, I would say. So not everybody is familiarized with this. So that's why I want to highlight this path. Also, I think it's very important um, 
besides getting your license is to uh, look for other type of professional certifications. I'm here listing on only a few of them. There are plenty, uh, well, lead, NCARB, uh, when you get your license, uh, SC, SCI, I mean, CSI, RIM. So that only will give you more um, value as a professional and you are going to, to be able to apply maybe to better positions or diverse positions. So it will definitely open your possibilities to, to get in uh, the, the, the work that you want or the firm that you want to pursue. Um, we know that we are in a very, very competitive country. Everybody here are very competitive. So we need to, to be at that level too. And to be honest with you, most of the immigrants that I have met we just go for schooling all the time. We just want to get all these different uh, type of certifications because we want to lead, you know, we want to be uh, outstanding. And then you're probably gonna ask, okay, so I'm gonna go get a job, but what's my value? How do I do, how do I know what, what, what can, I, can I ask for? So there are these two different tools. Um, the AIA compensation report is something that you can buy from AIA. It's a very detailed uh, salary survey, but there is also this other tool on the, on the right, the salary calculator um, is free. You don't have to pay for that. So you go there and you click your uh, location, state, sometimes cities, and depending on the type of firm and the type of uh, position, you can see what's the low, medium, and high average salary for that specific position at that specific location. So that's a great tool when you're trying to, to apply for jobs and you have an idea on the range of salaries that you can be asking for. And another tool that I'm going to mention here is called, some, some states calls the firms fostering emerging professionals. Um, why emerging professionals? Um, AIA um, uh, has a, a group of emerging professionals, means students, uh, anybody that has no license, or if you got a license within the ten, last 10 years, you are considered an emerging professional. So these different states have this program where they uh, recognize and give awards to firms that are uh, fostering emerging professionals that are pr uh, providing outstanding benefits uh, for licensing process, uh, compensation, diversity, professional development. And Oklahoma has that program. Uh, AIA central states um, encounter, Oklahoma is part of AIA central states and they have a program that is called, um, I forgot the name, is Firms Friendly, program. So when you go to AA Central States Emerging Professionals Committee, you will see the firms that were awarded last year for being outstanding in fostering emerging professionals. So you may think, oh, maybe I should check with these firms, you know, if they are if they got that recognition, maybe I should check with them and see if I can get in. And finally, I would like to highlight the importance of finding a mentor. I had mentioned that uh, and and it, it, to me, I didn't realize that I needed mentors until way ahead in my career. And since then I have mentors and I have different mentors that I go and check with them all the time when I need advice, when I have a question, when I'm struggling. So my advice is don't be alone, don't stay alone, find your support system. And we as immigrants, I'm talking about this group here, you, Shaha, myself, we are providing that support system. So reach out to us and that's gonna help you in different parts in your career for entrepreneurship, business management, negotiation, community engagement, uh, many, many things. Uh, so definitely keep that in mind starting school, finding your mentors, your professors become your mentors in the future. Uh, and then when you start working, keep finding mentors and making those relationships because they will, they will be very helpful when you are struggling in something. And I hope uh, I had uh, 
some resources for you. I'm going to stop sharing now and I'm going to, I'm going to pass it on to you. Thank you, um, Grace. I'll wrap it up. So I'm going to skip this. Um, a little bit. So I'm. I'm. My name is Yu Walk. I am. I have a small business, a small firm in California. It's called YNL Architects, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, how to. How could could you start your own firm like in the future? So may, maybe this is a little. It has a little distance from you guys. Maybe you think that hey, this is not for me. You know, I'm, I'm still in college. You know how? When am I gonna start your own firm? But but to me, um, having the mentality of being able to run your own firm starts from, from school. You got to start learning like business management. You got to understand how the business works and, and, and all that. So I, I, I would like to share with all of you um, some of the tips that, that I have um, based on my experience over the years. But by any means, like my firm, you don't see my firm on national magazine or anything. So by any means, my firm is not successful, but is it, it can just kind of offer you some kind of like guidance of, of, of a way there's no correct way but there's there's a way for you to start your own thing so the first thing is uh, understanding your your legal status this is very important because some of the states if you are not um citizens or permanent residents you cannot even start your own firm so you probably should go through what Saha and Grace um, went through, work for someone else first, uh, get some experience and get your get your visa and, and all this legal status, figure it out before you you, you do this. And um, learn while you can and get your license. Um, getting getting your license is a no brainer. I mean, you, you gotta be the firm owner, you gotta be stamping the drawing. And, and what I meant by learn while you can is when you work for somebody, um, make sure that you ask all the all the questions because you always have a boss in front of you to for to help you. But once you start your own firm, there's no boss. I mean, the only thing that you can you can rely on is the internet, which is which is not accurate at all a, a lot of time. I mean, the internet is great, but they have a lot of false information. So learn while you can working for someone always volunteer yourself to 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 perhaps go to a job site for example to understand how construction works uh spend time going through the code book um learn look at some of the the construction document that 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 the firm did for other clients you know trying to understand like what how how you how can you effectively draw um details for example so that 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 will help you later later down in the road uh, immersed into the American culture. So this is this is kind of interesting. And when I when I first um, started working, I I had lunch myself uh, in my cubicle. You know, I don't want to socialize with other people because they talk about American football. They talk about like um, you know pop culture that I have no idea. You know, I just like to sit sit in my cubicle. And and you know this this is great. Well, it actually is not great, but what, what I'm trying to say is um, getting clients is, is, uh, is about what you know and what you can do. And also it's about relationship and, and how, how can a client trust you and, and how, can you, how can you demonstrate that you have, you have the ability to do the work. It's, it's about trust. It's about relationship. So it, it's funny that um, I, I and I shouldn't say that is I'm not saying that you have to learn like American culture. No, because it's enjoy. It's very enjoyable. Once I start like watching like American football and, and basketball, it's actually quite fun. And, and then you start talking to people, you know, like and, and you, you start to create conversations. And, and that's very important. And, and you will you will like it. And I'm pretty sure that that it will help your communication skill later down in the road. And uh, get public speaking help. It's it's very very important. You know, before I I, I actually hire a, um, a speech therapist to help me, even though it's still not great, but it's much better. Before I could never present anything in front of anybody. I mean, not not to mention that get up on a stage and 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 say anything. I would I would just freak out. 
And, and, and if you have your own firm, you got to do that because there's going to be a lot of presentation. I mean, you got to be able to not only graphically um, show your design, but you have to be able to communicate your concept of the design, for example. So that, that's very important. Save money. Um, let's say you get a job, you know, it's great. And then you start working on it and you start building your client. By the time you get your check, it could be months after you, you got your contract. So you always want to save enough money so that you can you can last like three, four, five, six months or whatever, however it, it, it takes so that you can you can get your first check. Marketing is a continuous effort. And, and this is very important because I can tell you how I got my first um, um, custom home design job is I, I attended this um, AIA um, design award uh, ceremony and, and one of my projects got an award. So it was up there on the screen and one of the developer was also at the ceremony for another project and he saw my work and, and he said, oh, I like your design uh, uh, and why don't, why don't you help me design a house? And, and that's kind of how I got into the residential market and that's kind of how I got my first custom home built. So. I know that it is not part of our culture. I mean, we, especially like as an Asian, I was taught to be humble, to not to say anything. You want to have your own firm, you got to develop that kind of personality. You know, you got to brag about your work and you got to be very clear what you can or cannot do and what, will you, what are you capable of. So that's why like a lot of this award might seem tedious, but it, it is necessary in terms of making your, your client trust you. So, and the next thing is turn your disadvantage into advantages. What, what I meant is because we're all from different country and we all speak different languages and, and, to, and, and that also means that it will bring another layer of clients into your business. So I started uh, working on international work, like um, doing Chinese projects um, during the economic downturn back in 2010. And that's kind of how I, I pay my bill back in the day and, and doing doing project in China. I mean, it, it, it's, it's another um, source of revenue, in, in, especially in bad times. So budget your overhead and expense. So think about who you hire or how many people you hire and whether I should have an office or very fancy car, you know, because that as, as, when you start your own business, is it wise for you to rent a $2,000 per month office? to just do sit there and do nothing, you know? And, and uh, should, I, should I hire a part-time uh, helper or full-time, you know? This is, this is kind of the thing that you have to think about. The way that I started was um, I didn't quit my full-time job when I first started. Um, I, I only quit my full-time job until I uh, secure something um, a little bit longer term, like uh, after I secure my uh, first or second or third clients. And, and, and then after that, I, I start um, completely doing completely independent. So, and the last thing is obtain and retain talent. And, and I think this, this is perfect thing to go back to Sahar's presentation because you, you got to understand what um, talent people are looking for. And, and you got to be able to support um, their, their growth. And, and, and it does benefit your own, own firm because it offers different perspective it is it it if it offers like it just improves the design and the management and, and the firm culture altogether. So that's just basic tips. Um, and I can I can keep talking for another two three hours, but I'm not going to. <laughs> um, the last thing that I want to bring up is as as the very beginning we 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 spoke of this thing called immigrant architects coalition. So our goal is to help each other create a community that that all the immigrant architects can get resource from, from and provide um, uh, resource to others. And, and we're, one, of, one of the resource that we are, we're working on is a comprehensive guide that, that kind of have all these different um, articles and tips to help you um, navigate a system, so to speak. So um, we have a lot more articles than, than, than what is up there now. Um, it's, it's not edited yet, it's, it's very draft form, but this is something that we're working, uh, we're actively working on and we're constantly looking for people who can share their experience as well. So um, finally, this is our email, email address and we'll be glad to be your mentor if, 
if 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 possible, you know, if we can help, we will we will try to help. So um, feel free to contact us. So that's pretty much all I have. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I I think we we kind of ran over time, so I'll probably answer. I think we we'll probably answer some of the questions that the audience has first. Thank you. Three very, very good presentations. Thank you so very much. I think you may have helped uh, a number of our uh, students, no matter if they're immigrant architects or not, because some just good basic information. Um, and I do think we had some good questions. Angela, do you want to pose those questions? Yeah, I would be happy yes. to. So we have one question from um, Morgan McCurdy yes. asked, you think that the advice about self-advocacy is applicable outside of the U.S. or is it is it really applicable here in the U.S.? And maybe if you could speak about firms in your home countries, if you're able to, um, I think she'd be interested in hearing more. So um, I've never worked outside of America. So a lot of my self-advocacy lessons that I learned is through the American culture experience, but Gracelia had um, quite a bit of stories about self-advocacy coming from <laughs> Colombia. Yeah. So I'm no, going to throw, throw it to her. It definitely applies to any country. And you have to advocate for yourself, whatever you are, if, even if you are in your ho home country. Um, but if the question would be in our own countries, if, if that happens, if we have those bias to towards immigrants, Yes, of course. It's that's something that comes from cultures, from being outside that culture. So that's why it's so important to to know how to advocate for yourself. And I think Shahad had really good points uh, that we hope all of you will will apply when you have to do it. Thank you so much. Um, are you able to share any information on what retention rates might indicate a high turnover? Um, when do you start sort of worrying in terms of retention rates? I see Ron said a place where two thirds of the people left each year. That sounds like obviously scary, scary. <laughs> <laughs> maybe not a good thing, but like, when do you kind of start worrying about, about retention? A big part rates? of it is relevant to the size of the firm that you're applying for really. Um, I could, we could definitely like, depending on the firm itself, knowing the size and then start looking up their, that data specifically. Um, I mean, you should start worrying if um, it's like 50%, <laughs> that's for sure. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> but two thirds is like extreme, but no, jokes aside, um, consider um, like what's their tenure. So if you're not necessarily understanding those numbers, um, What's the tenure mm -hmm. um, of typical average tenure um, people staying in a firm? Okay. So tenure is like how long they've been working there. Um, mm -hmm. You want people staying at least at least three to five years, um, so they're actually getting exposure to projects from start to finish. Thank you so much. What if you ask the question and they don't know the answer? Oh, is that's that a great. Red flag? That's when you're like, <laughs> oh. Okay. <laughs> You're not paying yeah. attention to this really yeah. great data point. Or they don't, or they don't want to answer it. Um, right. Now I do have to put the, add the caveat that unfortunately international students don't have many choices because um, a lot of the time, like, is the firm willing to sponsor you or not? Um, right. Unfortunately, that's a reality. So a lot of international students have to pick firms that provide that are willing to provide um, sponsorship. And in that way, in that, when you are trying to put your foot in the door, that's fine. Maybe it's not the firm you like. You put your foot in the door and you go straight to AIA. Start getting involved. Make okay. relationships, build your network and go somewhere else that way. Um, and take because, advantage, I was gonna say, take advantage of the AIA student rate. Yeah. Yes, you right, right. For 18 yeah. months before you graduate, you have a one year and a half free membership. So take advantage of that. Yes. And I would add to, to the retention um, thing too, is as an international student, you wanna, you wanna have, you wanna go in through a firm where they will, it will last a little bit because 
you don't want to get fired in the middle of your H-1B visa, for, for example. And, oh, right. and, and that, yeah. that's a hassle. You have to pay the lawyer mm-hmm. fee and all that stuff. So, so it's, it's, it's actually a really, 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 really important question uh, when, you, yeah. when, you, when you get into the interview. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question open to anyone. Um, this is from Muzabir. If you work for a year in Texas and a year in Oklahoma, for example, is that a problem for AXP hours? Does anybody know? Not at all. Okay. You just need to make sure that your supervisor uh, is signing up for those hours. Um, like I specifically transfer experience from Colombia to here. Mm-hmm. When I did my PAD, there was no foreign architect. Okay. So I was able, they, they, they accepted one year of experience in another country. So I was able to do that with my boss in Colombia. So no, you don't have, as long as you keep, every time you work with someone, make sure you are reporting hours, no matter where you are, you are reporting hours. That is so helpful. Thank you, Graciela. Um, I think we have time for one more quick question if anybody wants to ask it. I wish we had another half hour of Q&A because no, yes. it's been so helpful. And Angela, also, just everybody watch the chat. Diana put a thing in for uh, a, a link for OU Innovation Hub that helps startup programs. So that's very helpful. Yeah, that's super helpful. And I also put a link in the chat. If you scroll back up to 1214 about our STEM OPT here at OU, all I believe all of our degree programs do qualify for STEM OPT in our college, which is really great because then you get a few extra years um, on your OPT. So awesome. Um, and if well, anybody oh, um, have any questions, I'm sorry. Um, we don't have, we can extend this and you can send us email or whatever. I mean, we, 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 we would love to try to help you guys and try to answer as many questions as you guys have. So thank you. We are so grateful. And if you didn't catch their email addresses earlier, just email Ron or myself. We have contact information. We're happy to share. Right, yes. Please join us in thanking um, the the whole panel. This has been really amazing. Oh, we we are very honored that you invited us to speak. Thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity to connect with with your students. Yeah, thank you so much, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was wonderful. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you. Good luck. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.